ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard. Hope you're having a wonderful Monday evening. Today is a special episode and a very exciting episode because we have a gentleman that is a businessman, but his, his belongings or his beginnings started in the NBA, and now he's a philanthropist. He's also an actor, a filmmaker, and also an author. He's going to be on the Sherrard Show today. We're going to be talking to him. Uh, I'm so excited Mr. Kenyon Glover is on the show, but before we get started, the Sherrard Show is brought to you by Essence Television. If you want to see the best episodes of your life, just tune in to Essence Television on your Roku, and you can watch all of the episodes of the Sherrard Show from Stevie Wonder to the Manhattans to the Isley Brothers to Mel Carter. Some of the greatest individuals who've ever stopped by on the Sherrard Show is right on Essence Television. It's right on your monitor, and you can see Essence Television as well. It's brought to you by iHeartRadio, ladies and gentlemen. So if you miss the episodes of the Sherrard Show. You can always watch them or hear them on iHeartRadio, or you can subscribe to our newsletter that's on your television right now. Well, this gentleman was in the NBA. He played for the Milwaukee Bucks, suffered an unfortunate knee injury, but he used that negative to do something positive and help others. He's a philanthropist. He's also an author. And he stopped by the Sherrard Show to talk about what he's got going on on our segment tonight talk, uh, entitled Having Fun While Getting the Work Done. Welcome to the show, Kenyon. How are you, sir? Hey, hey, I'm good. I'm good, man. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited about this, man. Thank you. We really appreciate you uh, taking a moment out of your busy schedule to be on the Sherrard Show. Now, tell us a little bit about um, when you were in the NBA. Did you always have dreams of being a filmmaker, a fashion model, or a philanthropist, or was it always title or bust? <laughs> no, it was it was it was always NBA for me. It was always NBA or or nothing, you know. Um, and I went, when I made it to the NBA, it was like, you know, this is my dream. This is what I worked so hard to, to accomplish. So, and when I had that that career the injury, it was like, okay, what am I going to do now? Um, I have no clue. I was lost. So I was like, okay, you know, I have a I have a business degree, so let me utilize this degree that I have, a, uh, you know, a bachelor's degree in. So I decided to start my own business, and I just happened to stumble into filmmaking by accident. I had no no interest in filmmaking, acting, the entertainment business at all. So I kind of stumbled into it by accident. So you know, I'm I'm proud that I did. I'm proud that I did. Now, when you say you stumbled into a Kenyan, how did that happen? Well, I was I went to uh, audit a uh, acting class with a friend of mine, and <clears throat> I was just sitting in the back, you know, just checking it out and just to see what it was about. And the the acting coach asked me to participate because because she was I guess shorthanded that night of actors that came in. So I was like, okay, whatever, I'll participate. And when I when I participated, I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. You know, she gave me the script to to memorize and. And, and work on, and then I was like, okay, you know, I, I think I, I think I like this. So after the class, I, I, I signed up to take the classes myself, and the more I did it, the more I fell in love with it. So I was like, you know what, I think I want to take this serious. I think I want to do this as a career. So I moved out to LA, and I started doing it full time, and the next thing you know, I was getting booked for different roles. Um, my first major role was Young and the Restless, which I was excited about. And um, from there, it just it just took off. So you were acting right along Shamar Moore and the Young and the Restless. I think he had left the show when I got there. He had already left the show and went on to do other things. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I was I was on there for a minute. You know, um, you get started your first big gigs on Young and the Restless. My first big gig was a pickle in the third grade. Now wait a minute, Kenyon, how is that even possible? But that's that's wonderful. You you've taken off from there. Now when the bug bit you and you doing major things on major soap operas on major television, where did you go from there? Um, you know, I started to get booked for more and more things. I started to get booked on. Um, I was on CSI, Criminal Minds. Um, the game. I was on Drop Dead Diva, Born Again Birth. I started booking a lot of different TV shows, uh, guest starring roles. I started booking film, like uh, leads and films. So it was like, wow, you know, I'm starting to really, really grasp a hold of this this entertainment thing and this acting thing. And I was like, you know what? I want to start um, producing my own content. I want to start doing my own films because I was mostly like an action kind of guy, you know. And the roles I was getting was more like drama, mostly. And I was, you know, I'm a martial artist. So I wanted to do like martial arts films because I've always been a fan of Jean-Claude Van Damme and 
Michael John White and, and you know and, and um Steven Seagal. So I wanted to I wanted to do those kind of films. So I was like, you know what, how can I get into that genre? So someone was like, well, you know, why not create your own film? And um that's how I kind of got into filmmaking. I just started getting creative and kind of kind of creating my own content as far as what I wanted to really, you know, be in. So that's how I really became a filmmaker, you know, just started creating my own thing and doing my own thing. Well, it's nothing like, it's nothing better than a good martial arts movie. You know, if you go yeah. back to one of my favorites is Enter the Dragon, you were mentioning oh. Michael Jai White um, yes. and uh, Flesh and Bone and, uh, oh yeah. man, uh, uh, what is that, Bone? What is that, um, Blood um, and Bone? Yeah, Bloody Bone, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh my goodness, man, the, in, uh, the opening scene when he talked about you got you got to the count of five, you know, and then he <laughs> woke up. That's oh, come thing. on, man, don't even get me started on that. But um, when you say you're martial artist, so you're black though? Yes, yes. I grew up, I, as a matter of fact, when you say Enter the Dragon, I grew up watching Bruce Lee. I grew up watching and studying Bruce Lee. I mean, that's that's how I modeled my martial arts after Bruce Lee. So I was a big, big Bruce Lee fan, man, since what, like five, six years old? So that that's all I that's all I did growing up was do martial arts and play basketball. That was pretty much my lifestyle as a kid. Well, you know, it's funny because um, I'm a martial arts junkie too, and I absolutely love those films where you see, uh, you know, um, like you know, like I said, Jim Kelly. You said Van yeah. Damme, uh, Steven Seagal. I mean, every movie of Steven Seagal I watch, you know. But I got I got hooked on you know watching uh, Van Damme and Bloodsport 1990. Yeah. So I yeah. get it. <laughs> and so, so when that bug bit you, um, did you begin working on a film that was a black martial arts film? Yeah, actually, I um, well, a friend of mine had created this project. It was called uh, Anika, A E N I C A, and he was looking for a, a black martial arts lead actor. And he just happened to stumble upon my social media, and he said, "Wow, you know, I like your I like your look, and you know, can you do martial arts?" So I went and did the uh, uh, the, the test for him. And I, um, you know, auditioned, and he was like, "Yo, you got the part, man." So we turned that. That it was supposed to only been like one episode, but we we gained so much popularity that it became like four or five seasons of it. You know, like a webisode. It was just internet based, but it became so popular, and that was kind of like my my entryway into uh, you know my first martial arts project. And after that, I was I was hooked. That's all I wanted to do was martial arts projects after that. So. That's that's how the bug hit me as far as the martial arts goes. Wow. Now with your career um ending in NBA and then picking up so dramatically in film, did you enjoy more being an NBA player or you enjoy now being a film star? Oh man, it's just nothing can replace the love of basketball, man. That was my first love, my first passion. I always will be. So um yeah, I mean that that's 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 probably the most um passion I, I probably will ever have is playing the game of basketball. I mean, I love acting, don't get me wrong, I love filmmaking, but basketball is something that I fell in love with since I was six and and and, and I made it to the top level. And that was always my dream, to accomplish that dream. So that will always be something I could take to my grave and say, you know what, I made it to the NBA. I accomplished my dream that I set out for myself when I turned seven years old. And that will always be like the top of the, at the top of the list for me. No, that's unbelievable. Now, um, we are talking to Kenyon uh, Glover. This is an NBA player, film star, fashion model. He's been doing big things in the industry. Um, he's just getting started. Young man, only 38 years old. Heck, I think this shirt is older than him. But he's um, <laughs> actually had a fascinating career, and it's just um, just the very beginning. Now, let me ask you a question, because the comments are blowing up already now, and I'll get to them in a moment. I can't wait to ask you some questions. But I'm going to beat one of my audience members to this question. Um, his question, which is mine as well, what was it like when you first got to the NBA? What was the thing that really, um, in your mind, just said, you know what, this is a reality check? You know what? Um, <laughs> I would probably say when I got my first check. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> when, I first, when I first got my check, I was like, okay, I've made it. I've made it. When I saw all those zeros and the commas, I was like, okay, this is, this is the real deal. Wow. I, I really made this. Like I made this happen. I'm here. I've arrived. So that was probably the most exciting point of me saying, you know what? Wow, I made it. This is this is this is this is real. This is legit. Mm -hmm. Now, when you when you played your first game and you got into the game, who was the team you were playing the first time when you got on the floor? Uh, uh, Chicago Bulls. 
Oh, really? So so they threw you right to the Wolves. Or were the Bulls any good at that time? No, that was kind of terrible at that time. Oh, <laughs> that oh, oh it must have been the time when Tim Floyd was a coach, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, okay. I get you. All right. So so you had an easy night that night. But what was it like? What was it like playing with the professionals now and no longer playing with the collegiate or you know, playing in the D League? Wow. You know what? It was it was the game was so much faster. It was like it was like going from from being like, you know, being a boy to playing with grown men. So, you know, like the game was so much more faster. You know, the guys were so much more more stronger, taller, you know, more physical. So it was it was a it was a quick adjustment, you know, because I went from playing overseas to right to the NBA. And you, you could see the, the difference right away, you know, and you have to adjust quickly. But thank goodness I played overseas first and I got a little taste of playing professional. But it's a whole different ball game when you're playing the NBA and playing overseas. You know, but I mean that's that that's what made the adjustment easy for me. But at the same time, you know, when you're playing against NBA players, man, they they're on another level. They're on another level. So I mean, I embraced it, man. I loved it. I loved it. The greatest competition in the world. So wow, you know, and, and the most sought after competition yeah. and experience. Now, um, was the trash talking on a whole nother level as well? Oh man, yes, nonstop. I mean, it's nonstop <laughs> talking. Nonstop talking. Everybody's talking trash to each other. You know, everybody's so amped up and so, you know, energized. And it's like everybody's just ready to go at your throat, like nonstop. You know, everybody's always like coming at you full force. You can't hold me. You can't stop me, man. You're too little. And for me, I'm only 6'4. And, you know, now in the league, everybody's like, you know, the point guard is like 6'8, 6'9. So, <laughs> you know, I, I was really considered short. But, um, you know, I wasn't backing down from anybody, you know. So I'm, I'm here, too. I've arrived, too. So you have to deal with me, too. So, you know, I, I, had, to, I, had, to, I had to kind of get in there and kind of show, me, you know, I'm not a punk. <laughs> wow. Now, do you have to do that every night? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh my absolutely. goodness. Yeah, yeah. There's it? no backing down. Every night, you got to bring it. 110%. 110%. That's why it's the NBA. No slacking. You know, one thing that's funny that I had to tell my audience members, because they're going to uh, probably ask this or miss this, but you're tall. You want to, like, you're very tall to the common person, but yeah. short in the NBA world. Right. But you're very tall if you wanted to be a football player, 6'4", you know, yeah. because basketball players are usually tall and bigger than linebackers and linemen like LeBron James would be huge compared to a lineman. But the funny yeah. thing that's very interesting to me is that Gary Payton is taller than you, but he looks so tiny on the court. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, Gary Payton is actually only 6'3". I'm actually taller than Gary. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, by an inch, but yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, on the court, he's going to look tiny. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But but you know the funny thing about it, and we're going to transition in a moment. What was it like the first time you saw Shaq in person? Oh, my goodness. Like, the biggest man i ever seen. Like... <laughs> I mean, I mean, not only Shaq is tall, but he's like wide and like just big. So I was like, wow, this is a big dude right here. You know what I'm saying? And and immediately, you know, not that I was scared, but I'm like, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to go in there and, and, and get rough with Shaq and body Shaq because, you know, he's going to push me like I'm a little ant or something. You know what I'm saying? He was strong, man. This dude is like strong, like powerful strong. So, yeah, Shaq is, Shaq is a big dude. Big dude. No, no. Now, was he every bit of the seven one that they posted? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Every bit of it, yeah. But now, you know, the thing that's interesting, though, uh, Kenyon, is that you appear to seem like you prepared for the post career. But there's a stat that says that 75% of the NBA players, once they leave the league, go and file bankruptcy. But you seem like you were smarter than that. Is it because of your business degree, your rearing, or you just had smart acumen? Well, I just had smart, you know, uh, smart acting, you know, um, I just wasn't one of those guys that was a big spender. Um, I wasn't real like, you know, the kind that was flashy and trying to buy jewelry and all these houses and expensive cars. That just wasn't my style because I was just, you know, I was raised to be very humble and be, be very conservative. So um, I just was not a flashy kind of dude. I just, I just didn't want to go buy a Bentley and uh, you know, two million dollar house, and I, it just wasn't me. So, you know, I was just very smart with my money, and I invested it and, and put it into different things that 
you know, that could make me money on top of the money. So uh, plus, you know, I had a business, like you said, I had a business degree as well. So that was pretty much my mindset, you know, just starting my own business and, and investing in my own business, investing in myself. So now, Kenya, speaking of that now, for NBA players and people who are watching the show right now, what kind of advice would you give them for those who are getting those big contracts soon to get those big contracts and feel that it's going to always be there? Um, well, know that it's not going to always be there. <laughs> um, just to, to make smart investments, um, really, really have a very good financial team behind you that's going to help you manage your money. You have to really, really have a team that's gonna help you manage your money and help you put it into invest, investing into things that's gonna bring you money back. Um, um, and don't be really trying to buy expensive things like expensive jewelry and houses and cars and all these things because you know, after a while that, that stuff is gonna really, really depreciate. <laughs> well. I mean, before you know it, it's going to depreciate. So this is just about being smart and, and, and having smart investments and having the right team of people behind you that's not going to let you spend all your money and be just just done with your money. So that's my advice. You know, just really, really look at the look at um, investing in a portfolio of different things, whether it be real estate, you know, businesses, um, um, you know, other different things. There's so many different things out there that you can invest in that will allow you to accumulate more and more money on top of your money. Now, let me ask you a question, King, you know, we're going to get to the questions in a second. Everybody calm down. We got about 50 questions. We're not going to get to them all, but we got a lot of people want to ask you questions, but let me get it, get one in now. Um, so Kenyon, say for example, okay, you just come into the league, you're 21 years old, you get a rookie deal. Your first um, contract is, you know, three years, at uh, $8 million, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, break it down to me what that's like. Who gets what and what do you really have once it's all said and done? Well, if you get a contract like three years, $8 million, um, you might personally pocket $2 million of that um, because, you know, you have to pay, you know, your agents. Your agent's going to get, you know, it depends on how, mu how much percentage y'all worked out. Your agent might get 10 to 15% of that. You have your management that might get 10, 15 percent of that. Then you have to pay your lawyer fees. Um, then other people that 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 works and manages your money, you got to pay them, you know, their share. So a lot of that is getting taken away, like immediately off the top. Um, <clears throat> you, you know, over that three years, out of eight million, um, that that comes out to roughly what two and a half million a year, uh, a little over two and a half million a year. <clears throat> and out of that two and a half million a year, you probably, like I said, only seeing probably not even a million, probably like 800,000. Oh, 000. wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I say you, you really have to be very careful how you spend your money, you know, because you're not going to really guarantee, you know, that you're going to get all of that money, especially if you, you know, you get hurt or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you may have a, you know, God forbid, a career in the injury like I did. And, you know, they immediately cut your contract off and out of that $8 million deal, you may only get two or three million, you know? So, you know, you just have to be very careful with, your, with, with, with those kind of contracts and spending that money. So now a lot of ball players um, or, or athletes period, when they first get that deal, they go out there and buy a house and then they go out there and buy the most expensive car. But I hear that when you get that kind of money, it's foolish to go out there and buy a brand new car. They say it's best to lease, is that correct? Um. I don't really know. Like I said, I wasn't really one of those people that got expensive cars. Um, but I know a lot of people that did, a lot of ball players that did, and a lot of them did lease their cars. They wasn't really just going out and just paying cash. A lot of them did. The one that got the, the ones that got the big contracts, like you know, if you're getting 30, 40, 50 million over two, three years, if you're making 20, 30 million a year, yeah, they're gonna go out and just pay cash for a car and just be done with it, you know, without having any notes or anything. But the ones that have the little contracts is mostly, yeah, leasing their cars. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Now let's talk about your book. Now you are an author, an accomplished author, and you've been writing, um, and, and you've done, um, you do motivational speaking as well. Now tell us a little bit about your inspiration behind your book. Well, the inspiration came um, because I was, I was dealing with a lot of inner demons, man. I was going through a lot of trials and tribulations, hardships, adversities, um, 
struggles. Uh, I was dealing with major depression, um, having suicidal thoughts. I attempted suicide on three different occasions. So I was I was going through a constant, constant battle of dealing with my inner demons on a pretty much an everyday basis. And it just came to a point where, you know, I said, Kenyan, enough is enough. I can't keep dealing with this. I can't keep going through this struggle. This 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 flesh and this, you know, flesh and spirit is 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 is, is battling on the inside of the, you know, my mind. And I just got tired of it, man. It was just, it was like, okay, either I'm just gonna surrender to God and just give God my life, or I'm just gonna just surrender to death you know it, i had to make it i had to make a decision so i was like you know what? i'm just going to surrender to you god and just allow you to take over and, and lead my lead the way so <clears throat> when i was writing this well, well it started out writing a journal i was actually just writing a journal of um the different things i was going through and the things that were that was bothering me at the time and i just started writing out my emotions and <laughs> as i was writing out my emotions um, it, it became more and more and more each and every day. And I didn't realize I had all of that emotion so pent up in me. So as I'm writing, I just started writing so much. And and after I was done writing, I'm like, wow. I, I was it probably was like two notebooks for you know how the notebooks is like, you know, like I think 50, 60 pages each wow. notebook. So I had two notebooks full and I was like, wow, let me do like this could be a book. This probably can help empower some people or impact some people in a positive way if they see my story and my journey of what I've been going through and, and how I dealt with what I was going through. And <clears throat> that's how the book came about. I just turned that journal that I wrote into a book. You know, of course I had to condense it, but um, that's how the book came about. Now, now Kenyon, um, my question to you now, this is, uh, we're going to get to the questions. Give me two minutes. We'll ask the questions. Now, Kenyon, what triggered from a man that was in an NBA, good looking guy on a young and restless doing all these big things, why would anybody believe you want to commit suicide? Well, when I had my career in the injury, when I had my career in the injury, uh, injury um, my, my NBA career was done and I just got started. Like I, I had got to where I wanted to get to my whole life and it was taken away from me like the snap of a dime, I mean, snap of a finger. Um, and my career was done. And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> like, Lord, you gonna do this to me? After I, I've worked so hard to get to this point and you just snatched my career away from me. Um, it was it was devastating to me. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't deal with the pain and the hurt. And I felt like God betrayed me. You know, he allowed me to get to this point to take it away from me. And I just felt betrayed by God. And I was just at the lowest point that I've ever been in. And I just couldn't overcome that that pain and that feeling of, mm. of, of God betraying me and God letting me down. So, well, that, Kenyon, you know, you preaching, man, and, and you preaching, brother. And I didn't even bring the collection plate. I wish you would have told me I would have <laughs> passed the collection plate because you preaching, ladies and gentlemen. This is Kenyon speaking some big stuff, powerful stuff about his career, his book, and his motivational speaking. Now, I'm an ordained minister, Kenyon. I've been in the gospel for many years, thank God. And you're touching on something that many Christians are very fearful to talk about. Everybody talks about how much they love the Lord and praise God and things like that, but nobody talk, goes down that dark road where they feel like in many times God has betrayed them or let them down. That's almost a taboo kind of conversation, but it's real. And it's yeah. not hard to feel that because oftentimes you read in your Bible and mine, Many of God's men felt the same way. Yeah. Now, your book, The Intention, it sounds like you're just trying to save somebody from that dark place that you had gone. Is that correct? Exactly. Exactly. You know, everybody that reads it, they can really kind of um, embrace the journey that I went on and realize that even though I, I had my struggles and trials and tribulations, God was always there. You know what I'm saying? He was always there. I, I may have left him, but he never left me. And he was always in the midst of the, the, the things that I was going through and the adversities and all of that. And he was like, okay, um, even though you're going through this, I'm still going to get you through it because I have a bigger plan for you. And I didn't realize that he had a bigger plan for me until now, of course, recently, you know, when I just kind of went through it and kind of, you know, got out of it. But um, that was, I, I see now that was all a preparation, you know, for me to get to this point of really, of really walking in my purpose. Amen. Amen. Boy, I tell you, man, um, this is powerful. Okay. Are you, is it okay for we to take some questions now? Oh yeah, absolutely. Bring them okay. on. 
Okay, all right, it's blowing up. I'll get to as many as I can, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so this is from Adam. This is from Adam. He's all the way in Iowa. He said, Adam, uh, I, Adam says, first of all, Kenyon, you're very inspirational to me. Um, congratulations on your book and all the things that you're doing. So um, first of all, where can he purchase your book? That's the first thing he's asking. Um, you can go to my website, KenyonGlover.net, or it's on Amazon. Just go to Amazon and search for The Rebirth and Resurrection of a New Man. By okay, Kenyon. very good. Oh, and now Adam's main question is, um, how did you get out of your dark place when you found yourself at your lowest? Um, you know what? It took a lot, a lot, a lot of praying. I had to really go through a metamorphosis. I had to go through a transformation process. Um, you know, it, it says in the Bible, so you know this verse, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I had to really allow my mind to transform. And I had to trust God through the process to know that, okay, I, I need to trust God and, and, and be faithful in this process and know that, um, you know, it's not over. I'm not done. I'm not finished. There's a bigger plan for me. There's a bigger purpose for me. So it just took a lot of praying, man. I had to surround myself with people that was going to uplift me and empower me. Um, you know, it took a lot, a lot of discipline. Um, I just had to really change a lot of things. I had to sacrifice a lot of things. Um, and, and, and I just had to really, you know, come to the, to the, make a decision that, you know what, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of going through this, 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 this dark place. I'm tired of being in this, in this, in this, in this suicidal mode, you know, I just got fed up with it. And when you just get fed up with something and you're just tired of something, so it, it, it forces you to kind of man up. I have to man up and say, you know what? I'm, I'm coming out of this. I'm coming out of this better than I've ever been. And that's Amen. why I had to make that decision. Amen. Very good. Appreciate your question, Adam. This is from Tasha from South Carolina. Her question to you is, how do you keep yourself out of that dark place when the devil is trying to put you back in it? Very good question, Tasha. Wow, you know what? It's funny that, that she asked that question because <clears throat> I still have those dark thoughts pretty much on a daily basis, but I've learned to kind of combat those dark thoughts. I immediately go into prayer. I immediately pick up the Bible, start reading. I immediately start listening to motivational videos or motivational speeches, you know, whether it be, um, this uh, T.D. Jakes or Creflo Dollar or Eric Thomas or Les Brown, I immediately have to switch up my, my mindset. I have to kind of cram my spirit with things that are going to uplift me and empower me and inspire me and motivate me. So it's like immediate. As soon as I get a thought, as soon as I have, you know, that, as soon as I notice, okay, the devil is trying to sneak in. He's trying to, you know, implement those, those negative thoughts and put those suicidal thoughts back in the head. So I, like I said, I immediately go into prayer, immediately just, you know, kind of get into a, um, a state of mind to say, okay, let me, let me start listening to some positive music, uplifting music, motivational videos, start praying, start speaking to God, asking God, okay, remove this, 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 these negative thoughts from me. So that's kind of how I, I kind of combat those kind of feelings and thoughts. Amen. Amen. Now this is from, this is from Sean from Chicago. His question is, uh, Kenyon, first of all, congratulations on all your success. You're an inspiration to so many. His question is, why is it speaking about suicide in a Black community is like taboo? Say that again. What was the question? He said, why is it when you speak about suicidal thoughts and suicide in the Black community, it's like taboo? Nobody talks about it. Um, I, I guess people want to push it under the rug because they don't really see it as important. Um, I think because especially men, black men, we, we don't want to seem like we're weak. We don't want to seem like we um, um, vulnerable or anything like that. But I tell, you know, especially my, my black men, like you, you need to talk about it. You have to talk about this because if you don't kind of vent and get your emotions out, it's going to get harder and harder and harder until you get to a point where you're going to be such in a dark place that you're not going to see no light at the end of the tunnel. Mercy. So, I encourage people to just, you have to talk about it and, and be, don't be afraid to, to be vulnerable. Don't be afraid to um, just admit, you know, that I'm depressed or I'm, I'm suffering, I'm going through it, you know, and that's what people like me, you know, I love, I love trying to get people to open up, 
You know, I think I have that gift to kind of get people to open up about whatever they're going through, whatever they're faced with, the anxieties or depression or sadness or loneliness or whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, especially in the black community, it's like it's, it's, it's frowned upon, it's looked upon as, uh, you know, they're weak or they're vulnerable or, you know, whatever the case may be. It's looked at as a negative thing when it's not. You know, we, we need to just start talking about it more and, and making it a, more of a conversation instead of looking at it as a bad thing. Hey Amen. Very good question, Sean, and a very good answer. Uh, we'll cut time for two more questions. This is from Alicia from Las Vegas. She's saying, um, her question to you, Kenyon, is, do you, or are you not judgmental? Do you, are you judgmental no matter what somebody tells you? Um, do you judge them or not? No, I've never been a judgmental type. <clears throat> never been a judgmental type. And, and that's, and that's the thing about when you, when you talk about depression or you talk about being depressed or whatever, um, or mental health, people want to judge you immediately. Like I said, based on um, um, just being weak or, or not being vulnerable or whatever, people judge you immediately. And I've learned, I mean, since I was young, I've never been a judgmental type. You know, I was taught not to be judgmental. So, and me going through what I went through is the last thing I am is judgmental because Amen. I know how it is. Know how it is, and I would never judge anybody. Amen. Very good. Okay, we have time for one last question. This is from DC, from DC um, in West Palm Beach. He's saying, "Congratulations, brother! You're so inspirational. I'm a big NBA fan." Um, he has two questions for you. His first question is, "What was the extent of your uh, career-ending injury? Why wasn't it one you could rehab from?" That was the first question. Well, I tore my total kneecap. My whole kneecap ruptured. So during that time in 2006, they didn't have the kind of technology that they have nowadays. So my knee really couldn't be fixed all the way. I mean, it was fixed probably like 60%. So, you know, I could not play at that level again because I just, um, my knee would not, you know, allow me to. So um, yeah, I tore, ruptured my whole knee, like the kneecap, the inside, the ligaments, the muscles, the tendons, everything was gone, it was done. Oh, well, and his second part of his question is, after the COVID, what cities are you planning on traveling to to uh, encourage the youth? Every city I can get to. <laughs> every, <laughs> every city across the United States. Um, we're already trying to put a plan together to, you know, go to as many cities as I can. So um, it's, it's still a work in progress, but I'm trying to go to every city I possibly can and, and just, you know, empower as many people as I can. So I want to empower a billion people this year. That's the goal. Very good, very good. Now, um, I could, I can't take any more questions. I appreciate that, but um, I'm willing. If you can always email me at Essence Television Network. Um, that's Essence Television Network. It is on your monitor to um, if you have more questions for Kenyon, and I can pass it on to him. Or if you want to email him directly, what's your email that they can be able to reach out to you uh, for Kenyon? It's kglover1 at hotmail.com, or like I said, you can go to my website kenyonglover.net. And just go to the contact page and, you know, just fill out the contact form and I'll get right back with you. Kenyon, you know, you're a fascinating individual. One of the greatest uh, interviews I've had in a long time. We really appreciate that, um, you being on the show. Many blessings to you. Now, my question to you directly, will you come back on the Sherrard show soon? Come on, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if you're going to have me, I'm definitely willing to be back on this. Oh, my goodness, man. It has been a pleasure having this gentleman on there. So please, ladies and gentlemen, grab his book, email him. He also has a separate email for stalkers. So if you are if you're a weirdo, he's going to give you an email for that. But if, you, if you're about business, just look at your monitor. Um, and on tomorrow's episode of the show, we will have Mr. Master P stopping by the show to talk about his business and all the big things he has coming up. In the meantime, I'm Sherrard. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Glover, for being on the show. We'll yeah. see you tomorrow. Bye-bye now. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Sherrod Show. If you like additional information about our episodes, you can log on to thesherrodshow.com. You can also check us out on social media, like us on Facebook, look at our YouTube video, subscribe to our newsletter at Essence television networks at gmail.com if you would like to get information to the host sherrard you can email him at the show.com once again thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week